Hello and welcome back to Leadership in Nursing. This is Module 3. Just as in the previous modules, there will be prompts to pause the video and complete independent learning activities. By this point in the course, you will have noticed that the activities are focused on you and your experiences and ideas. One of the most valuable skills for nurse leaders is the ability to reflect on their experiences and behaviors and learn and grow from them. I hope you will find the learning activities beneficial to your growth, both professionally and personally. Again, let's look at the quality and safety education for Nurses Institute's competencies. The topics in this module include leading change, quality improvement, the role of the nurse leader as a manager, and staff development. These competencies are at the basis for all of the discussions in this course. Each topic can be related back to one of these competencies in some way, shape, or form, and should help guide your future practice as a nurse leader. Nurses and nurse leaders play a fundamental role in transforming healthcare. As recommended by the Institute of Medicine's iconic The Future of Nursing's report, nurses should be full partners with physicians to design, implement, and advocate for changes that can help meet the needs of the population while still maintaining resources and fiscal responsibility. There are many factors that impact change within a healthcare organization, and the organization must create a culture that actively participates and seeks ways to Im improve care and processes. As we discussed in module one, the organizational statements such as mission, values, and goals say a lot about their commitment to continuous quality improvement. Written statements are one thing, but as we all know, actions speak louder than words. The organization must use these statements to constantly seek out changes that they can incorporate to actually live and work by those values and goals. So the need for change is usually driven by things like quality and safety, of course, the work environment, organizational payment models, uh, new evidence-based practices, governing bodies, legislative policy, the economy, crisis, disaster. Gosh, have we all recently experienced a great deal of change with the COVID-19 pandemic? And not just one change, but change after change after change. If we didn't recognize the importance of adapting to and being resilient to change before the pandemic, we certainly should now. Change can be hard, and there are many things at stake when implementing a change in today's healthcare environment. It takes a unique and transformational approach. It requires nurse leaders to inspire others to be equally passionate about the organization's mission, values, and goals. Within healthcare organizations, nurse leaders function within a team of other nurse leaders, managers, and staff that work together to continuously improve safety and efficiency. And identifying the need to make changes is the first step to leading a change. The first step in planning for change, it must be clear what needs to be changed why it needs to be changed, who's affected, and what the contributing factors are. The change could be addressing a clinical problem where new evidence-based practice standards are available. It could be related to a workflow issue, safety, communication, or a technical issue. The scope and level of changes nurse leaders will address will vary upon your position. For example, a nurse manager on a step-down unit will have a different level of responsibility than the nurse leader in a chief nursing officer position. No matter the situation or level, gathering relevant information is first. This can be done through survey, observation, data collection, personal discussions or opinions. Once issues are identified, a team of nurse leaders begins to formulate a strategic plan, which is a document that outlines and communicates the priorities, goals, and strategies for workers. This can be a great motivational tool for nurse leaders to refer their, st their staff to so that they can see that their input and ideas are being put to use. The availability of resources is extremely important and using frameworks such as change theories can help nurse leaders plan for changes. To help motivate change, it's important that organizations have adopted a shared governance. The shared decision-making among frontline nurses and nurse leaders to provide direction for nursing practice within an organization. Facilities that maintain a culture of shared governance can act at all levels of the organization to promote positive changes. 
the principles of shared governance are accountability, ownership, equity, and partnership. In shared governance, nurses are active members of councils and task forces to help address problems and improve quality. When frontline nurses feel that they are empowered and that they have autonomy and control over their practice and feel that they are actively making improvements to healthcare delivery, they have increased job satisfaction and retention rates are higher. Frontline nurses and nurse leaders have the ability to transform healthcare and their participation in strategic planning and promoting a shared governance will help prepare future generations of nurses to continue to innovate and advance and improve healthcare. Pause the video now and take this readiness for change self-assessment. It might be easier to print the document. Let's take some time to reflect on ourselves and how ready we are for change. Complete the assessment on pages one and two. On the third page of the assessment, place your answer to each question in the corresponding place and tally up your scores for each of the seven traits of change readiness. Reflect on your results. In which of the seven traits did you score the highest? What about your results surprised you? Are there any actions that you will take in the future based on these results? One very direct motivator for change in healthcare organizations are payment models. In the fee-for-service, it's a more traditional model. Patients or payers pay for services performed. The pay for performance is a value-based model where providers are reimbursed based on quality and efficiency metrics. Partial or full capitation, patients are assigned monthly payment based on expected usage and providers still have incentive to avoid costly tests and procedures. Shared saving programs, incentive is provided based on population. Cost and quality are the responsibility of the provider or the accountable care organization. Bundled payment or episode of care incentive is provided for providers to limit the cost for all care services rendered in that episode of care. It's important that nurse leaders understand the different payment models used by their healthcare organization in order to have a better understanding of what changes they can help implement to decrease costs and improve quality. To help nurse leaders and healthcare organizations embrace change, they use change theory models as a framework to help plan for change and improve their chances for success. One common change theory is one you might be familiar with, Lewin's theory of change describes change as a three-step process that ends with the behavior being permanent. In the first phase, the need for change is recognized and exactly what needs to change is determined. In the change phase, the plan is created and implemented. In the refreezing phase, changes are reinforced and the change becomes the norm. Another common theory is Cotter's Eight Steps to Leading Change. I actually really like this theory and it feels like a more comprehensive and realistic approach to change within a complex healthcare organization. First, create a sense of urgency. Then form a strong coalition. Then create a shared vision and strategy for change. Communicate that vision. Enable action and remove barriers. Make short-term wins. Then build on the change then anchor the change in the organizational culture. I think it's important to understand that multiple theories for change should be used in nursing leadership. Which theory should be based on the situation and those affected by the change? It will benefit you to do your own research on some other change theories and also take the time to know your people and learn how they adapt and respond to change. There are different approaches or strategies for effective change implementation. Some approaches can be used for short-term solutions to a problem, like power coercive strategy, which assumes that workers will comply with changes, but this strategy is frequently met with opposition and resistance, though it can be effective in emergency situations. Using an empirical rational approach assumes that individuals are rational and will change their behavior if there is an incentive for them and if it's justified. An effective strategy for change implementation is a normative re-educative approach. 
where individuals who are affected by the change can participate in problem solving, solution finding, or the actual implementation of the change. This approach is reflective of shared governance, or a democratic approach, if you will. Although this approach can be time consuming, it is effective for successful long-term change and supports innovation. Speaking of innovation, innovation helps allows nurses to adapt to and respond to the practice environment, which is in a constant state of change. Nurse leaders must encourage their team to think outside the box and use their creativity to address practice problems. Some things we can provide our staff as nurse leaders to help promote innovation are allowing time to reflect and debrief, individually and in meetings, promoting autonomy and a willingness to take risks, providing them mentorship and acting as a role model for innovation, recognizing those individuals that make a difference, those clinical heroes who make positive changes, and promoting collaboration and the sharing of ideas in meetings. Nurse leaders should be aware of the factors that can influence collaboration. To act as change agents, nurses must actively seek ways to improve safety and quality and feel safe in bringing their ideas to the team. To be an effective change agent, the nurse leader must set the tone for their team and possess all of these characteristics. They must create a culture of innovation and build collaborative teams. Being innovative means starting something new or modifying current practices to help improve a process or an outcome. Change is inevitable. It can be planned or unplanned. Dealing with constant change can be hard. It will require resilience and again, all of these skills and characteristics. As nurse leaders, we must recognize that change will be met with resistance and we should be aware of and responsive to the needs of the team and help support them through changes. We should be the stabilizing force for our team. Pause the video now and follow the link to the discussion board forum and answer the discussion question titled Change Agent. Identify a leader in your organization whom you admire who inspires innovation. What leadership skills support their ability to be a change agent and an innovator of change? How does this leader support a creative and innovative environment? How do they catalyze, implement, and promote innovation? What skills do they use to foster creativity in successful ways? It is essential for nurse leaders to build their own personal power. Power can manifest as a strong network of people and connections that can help provide resources and support and expertise in the field. Being a strong leader provides you with power to influence change. Not only does personal power influence our experiences as nurse leaders, but also the politics of the organization influences our power. Nurse leaders have strength in numbers though. And when change is required, nurses have the ability to influence policy at the legislative level. There are many ways to get involved and most likely you're already part of a nursing organization that aims at improving healthcare, such as the American Nurses Association. It's important that nurse leaders educate themselves on policymaking and network and build and develop relationships with influential people, ones who have the power to help make policy changes. It is impossible to achieve goals without power. Having power gives you access to resources. To help you develop or increase your own personal power, here are some effective strategies. Develop expertise. Develop your network of people. Be reflective and self-aware. Pick your battles and let go of your ego. Work hard. Find positive role models. Develop the skills that help you become more fluid, adaptable, and resilient. Focus on your goals. Take risks. Be a team player. And most importantly, practice self-care. Nurse leaders must create their own power. A change within a healthcare organization is almost always related in some way to patient safety or quality of patient care. 
In order to determine if a change is needed, nurse leaders use a variety of quality and safety measures that provide them with relevant data. There are different ways to do this, and most common is basic statistics, measuring data or trends over time. In quality improvement measures, the rate is used to determine the significance of an issue. Rate accounts for variations in patient volume or the number of days with a urinary catheter. This type of data can be easily calculated with electronic health records. Patient satisfaction surveys provide healthcare organizations with valuable quality of care measures. Another important tool for measuring quality is benchmarking. It allows healthcare organizations to compare their rates with other organizations. The data are submitted to national databases for comparison. This provides healthcare institutions with quality metrics that can be used to make improvements. Measuring performance. Performance measurements can be nursing sensitive or they can be core measures. Nursing sensitive indicators are just that, sensitive to nursing practice focused on outcomes where nursing had primary influence, like falls or medication errors. Core measures offer information about the healthcare team's effectiveness. Core measures are set forth by the Joint Commission and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to help reduce healthcare costs and improve quality. Here are the nursing sensitive indicators and core measure sets from the Joint Commission. I've included these in your packet for future reference as well as to answer the following discussion question. I think it's really important for nurse leaders and nurses to know these. These are what are continuously being measured on our units and within our organization. Pause the video now and follow the link to the discussion board forum and answer the questions in the thread titled Nursing Sensitive and Core Measures. How are these measures addressed in your healthcare organization? Have you had experience with the organizational changes related to these nursing sensitive measures? Please explain. How do you feel that your unit or organization could improve on one of the core measures or nursing sensitive indicators? When complete, resume the video. Patient safety is a top priority for healthcare organizations across the globe and electronic health record is a critical tool for preventing medical errors. The EHR and computerized physician order entry acts as barriers for human error, and facilities are aiming to decrease the reliance on human memory and reduce skill and knowledge-based errors in healthcare. It's important to maintain a balance in the use of technology though, and workflow issues, technical issues, and lack of time cause people to deviate from standards and policies and can decrease time for collaboration. Safety must be a priority at every level of an organization, and the entire organization that is committed to safety and quality is a high reliability organization that meaningfully uses electronic health records to track data that can be used to improve quality and safety of patient care. It is estimated that approximately 251,000 deaths in the United States can be attributed to medical errors, and this is a much higher rate than other developed countries. So it is no wonder that healthcare organizations put patient safety as a top priority. So with all of the barriers to prevent medical errors, why do they still happen? The answer is human behavior. Nurse leaders should make their expectations clear and do their best to ensure that staff can meet those expectations in an efficient and safe manner. A useful tool for the rapid changes in the healthcare environment is the rapid change cycle or the plan, do, study, act. The first phase of the cycle is planning the who, what, where, when, and why. Leaders must ensure that there is a time limited goal, a detailed plan, and a measurable outcome. In the do phase, the plan is carried out and data is collected and documented throughout the change process. Here, leaders are documenting what is happening and why while the plan is being carried out. In the study phase, the data that they had collected and documented is analyzed and the results are compared with the previous processes. 
and compared to the predictions of the plan. In the act phase, final thoughts and reflections related to the change are shared, and it is decided whether the organization will adopt the change or return to the planning phase. The nurse leader must understand the difference between leadership and management. Leadership requires the ability to influence others, while management requires the ability to effectively use resources. It must be understood that healthcare is a business, and without proper management, the business will fail. Leaders should be able to manage human and fiscal resources and help control costs without sacrificing patient safety. Nurse managers may wear a lot of hats, and their roles can be complex. Overall, they are responsible for administering, initiating, organizing, maintaining, and monitoring nursing practice. The goals of the nurse manager are directed around maintaining patient safety and reducing costs. Staffing overages, overtime, staff burnout, and high turnover negatively impact an organization's bottom line. The National Healthcare Retention and RN Staffing Report estimated that a single nurse turnover can cost organizations upwards of $58,000. Support for nurses at the bedside and giving them resources and emotional support and positive recognition can help reduce nurse burnout and turnover. Management is the ability to coordinate resources, human and fiscal, and the process of designing and maintaining an environment where individuals work together efficiently to complete tasks. An interesting process for management came from Henry Vail, who described five managerial functions. Planning sets the path that must be followed, as we discussed while looking at strategic planning. Organizing involves gathering resources and establishing communication patterns. Commanding is the managers supervising the team and inspiring them to achieve goals. Coordinating involves motivating employees and forming effective groups that are engaged and hold each other accountable. Controlling involves comparing and measuring and adjusting or correcting behaviors. Human behavior plays a significant role in the ability for nurse leaders to implement effective changes. Some essential management skills. First, planning. It is vital to a team and a clear direction and a shared vision is essential. Communication skills are critical and managers should have the ability to build positive relationships that support communication. Emotional intelligence is essential to managers as well as we previously discussed when we talked about stress. The ability to make decisions and to take appropriate actions and the development of people or the ability to coach and mentor to maximize performance. Pause the video now and follow the link to the Mind Tools Management Skills Assessment. Take the quiz and follow the second link to the discussion board and answer the Management Skills Discussion question. What skills were you most comfortable with? What skills could use further development? Was there anything that surprised you? How will you use these results to make improvements? in how you manage as a nurse. When complete, resume the video. As a nurse manager or leader, you should have a good understanding of patient care models. Nurse professionals provide care in so many different environments and leading in nursing requires you to know and apply patient care models. Patient-focused care is aimed at cost containment and takes a holistic approach, providing continuity of care. In primary nursing, nurses care for the same patients. It is consistent and research suggests that there are better patient outcomes. However, it is usually an all RN model and may not include the help of unlicensed assistive personnel and also may not consider patient acuity. A functional nursing model or team approach to care, patients are assigned by the skill level and scope of practice of staff. It allows for fewer staff to care for more patients. In this model, teamwork, communication, and excellent delegation skills are necessary. An innovative care model expands nursing care to telehealth, video conferencing, or virtual care management. 
A float nursing model assigns nurses to areas where there's a need and helps when there are high volume situations. In modular nursing, staff are assigned to care for patients in a pod or a geographic location. It is a primary care model that can reduce burnout and increase autonomy. When making staff assignments, nurse leaders use patient classification systems or PCS. It's a tool to help determine the amount of care a patient will require. These systems take into consideration diagnosis, how many medications, levels of risk, and levels of skills required to care for that patient. Sometimes these systems are incorporated into electronic health records. Not all patient classification systems are created equal, and managers must consider all aspects of patient care when classifying how much work their care will require and should not solely rely on PCS. Staffing refers to having a sufficient amount of nurses with sufficient skills to provide safe and effective care to all patients. Projecting staffing needs should be done no more than 24 to 48 hours in advance. Full-time equivalence is equal to one person working 40 hours a week, and the number of full-time equivalents needed is calculated based on census and the previous year's nursing hours per patient Day model, which is a systematic nursing workload monitoring and measuring system, and it's used to determine the number of nurses required for care in specific areas. Patient care ratios are set by unions, legislations, and the organization's patient limits, and may not take into account patient acuity. A staffing model based on acuities uses patient characteristics to determine direct care hours. This is calculated by a software program. Care workloads are also computer generated. You will get more familiar with these measuring and monitoring systems in your future journey as a nurse leader. Scheduling refers to the set number of skills combinations that are needed for a specific time period based on census acuity and anticipated volumes. Centralized staffing means that there is one specific department that handles all staffing so that the burden of finding staff on short notice is not on managers or other staff. The charge nurses are in direct contact with central scheduling to communicate their needs. Some of you may have experience with centralized staffing and know that they are effective but can have disadvantages. Centralized scheduling may or may not be nurses and may not understand the appropriate skill sets needed to maintain safety and quality. Decentralized staffing means that there is a nurse or manager uh, or other individual that is designated to determine the staffing needs of the unit. This can help ensure the right mix of skills and managers are responsible for making all staffing decisions, which helps them have control over their budget. However, research suggests that this model may be more costly and it may not allow for the pulling of other nurses from other units. On the other hand, research also suggests that there's increased staff satisfaction with decentralized scheduling, and it can allow for self-scheduling and process that nurses tend to appreciate. The nurse manager responsibility for staffing and scheduling should include competency in selecting staff assignments, defining roles for staff, and knowing their scope of practice. They must be able to recognize trends and staffing patterns and recognize when there are shortfalls. Managers may need to stagger staff during the busiest times. There are many ways managers can maintain and improve safety while reducing costs. They are responsible for orientations of new staff and the evaluation of that orientation to ensure core competencies are met and that staff are prepared for the clinical environment. Staffing and scheduling needs should be met in a fiscally responsible manner, but never sacrifice patient safety. A nurse manager should engage staff in the scheduling process so that when the manager is not present, staffing issues can be addressed. There should be clear guidelines for decentralized staffing to find coverage and backup that's within the budget. In a centralized staffing system, nurse managers still ensure that appropriate staffing patterns are in place. Pause the video now and follow the link to the discussion board forum and answer the discussion question titled Patient Care Models. What care models have you used in practice? 
Do you think a different care model would have worked better or been more efficient for that particular level or environment of care? Does your current unit utilize LPNs and CNAs? If so, what is the skill mix when you have a full unit? When complete, resume the video. Nurse managers are responsible for maintaining balance between expenses and budget. Each unit is a cost center that is allocated a budget. The operational budget is an overview of projected costs of operation for one year. This includes salaries, benefits, supplies, pharmaceuticals, repairs, and maintenance. There should always be a cushion in the budget for unexpected expenses. The capital budget is associated with funds for larger projects or major purchases, and all expenses should be justified. Person personnel budgets estimate the direct cost of labor needed for the organization to run effectively. Productive time is time actually worked, and non-productive time is time spent on vacation, training, or education. In this budget, recruitment and hiring expenses must be included as well as projected turnover. Nurse leaders that are managers should understand the basic components of a budget. Understanding the budget can help the nurse leader better advocate for a budget that will meet the goals of the unit and the healthcare organization as a whole. Recruiting and retention. I think we can all recognize how rapidly healthcare changes and nurse leaders must be committed to the advancement of the nursing profession. They should be committed to providing work environments that can help recruit and retain nurses that are prepared to meet the challenges of that dynamic environment. Creating a positive work environment is essential. We've discussed this in some degree with retaining nurses, but in recruiting nurses, this is equally important. Recruiting and interviewing potential staff is time consuming and costly and takes careful planning. Interviews should be structured so that candidates can be easily compared. Group or individual interviews are the most common, but other formats may include the potential staff may be shadowing a nurse or demonstrating a skill or competency. Interview questions should be based on the topics of teamwork, a difficult patient, performance, evidence-based practice, and patient-centered care. It is important to allow the interviewee to speak openly about experiences with conflict resolution or with implementing changes with evidence-based practice. Here are some sample interview questions. I think we've probably all seen these in an interview or two. I've included this in your module three packet just to help in the future. Pause the video now and follow the link to the discussion board forum and answer the discussion question titled Recruiting and Retention. Have you ever been involved in the selection and interview process of nurses at your organization? If so, what was the process? What were the strengths of the process and what could be improved? Have you ever had an interviewee follow you or a fellow nurse on the floor? If so, was that a good experience? If no, do you think it would be beneficial to add to your agency's selection and interview process? Resume the video after you've completed this. Let's talk about motivation. There are many motivation theories that are used in nursing leadership, but I think a good place to start is one that we're all familiar with, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is the basis for many other motivational theories, such as Herzberg's motivation hygiene theory which states that when hygiene factors and motivating factors are present, that the result is motivation, satisfaction, and a strong commitment. Hygiene factors are things like wages, organizational culture, job security, work conditions, and work-life balance. Motivating factors are things like status, recognition, a challenging and stimulating work environment, and the opportunity for advancement. Nurse leaders have the power to inspire and motivate their team as well as potential team members and should create a positive work environment that is motivation for nurses to stay and attractive to nurses the organization is trying to recruit. Nurse leaders must create a motivating environment that engages nurses and helps them feel inspired by their work. This increases employee and patient satisfaction, employee productivity, nurse retention, 
it lowers absenteeism and improves patient safety. Some tips for creating a motivational climate are being aware of the factors that influence motivation like workload. Workloads that are too high are not sustainable and do not allow for professional growth. Providing recognition and reward related to performance helps motivate people. This should be consistent. It could be monetary or simply verbal positive feedback. Not everyone is motivated by the same thing and nurse leaders should learn what motivates their staff by building those relationships. Performance appraisals are an effective way to provide staff with feedback on their performance. Their strengths and areas where they may need improvement can be identified here. The process of performance appraisals should be consistent to prevent discrimination. Support for topics discussed in performance appraisals should be available for review, like report, reports or write-ups. These performance appraisals should be private and focused on the individual and their knowledge, skills, and attitudes related to nursing practice. Coaching was defined by Walker Reed in 2016 as the enabling of personal and professional growth leading to service improvement. Coaching is a partnership where coach and coachee are committed to improving performance. It requires good interpersonal relationships and a non-judgmental approach. When coaching, it's important that goals, strengths, and weaknesses are clearly established and that there's a plan to meet the goals. There are three stages of coaching pre-planning and assessment of learning needs, active coaching, and follow-up. Coach is a very important role for nurse leaders and requires practice, but we're all likely pretty familiar with coaching. As nurses at the bedside, whenever we delegate, we're coaching. Staff development. It is the responsibility of nurse leaders to contribute to the continuous quality improvement goals of an organization. It's important that the nurse leaders provide educational opportunities for staff to expand their scope of practice and their knowledge and skills. Some organizations have specific educational or staff development departments that can help coordinate learning opportunities or develop educational materials. Again, with the rapidly changing healthcare environment, nurse leaders must, must ensure that their staff possess the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary to function in this environment. Let's look again at the course outcomes. At this point, you will have assessed your own nursing leadership ability, style, and role, and be able to practice self-awareness, self-reflection, and self-assessment. You will have applied nursing leadership and management theories, strategies, styles, and roles, and demonstrated effective communication, interprofessional collaboration, and respect for others and their professional perspectives. You will have recognized sources of workplace stress and advocated for patients, self, and the nursing profession and integrated strategies for delegation, self-care, mindfulness, and coping, and now understand the impact of workplace stress on patient care and outcomes. You will have demonstrated a commitment to the nursing profession, mentorship, evidence-based practice, quality improvement, patient safety, and informatics and research, according to the QSEN competencies. Rejoice in your work. Never lose sight of the nursing leader you are now and the nursing leader you will become. I love this quote. We are all nurse leaders at various stages in our journey. To be a nurse leader is to continuously reflect and use our reflection to make better or different decisions in the future. I hope that you found the content of this course to be helpful when looking to make the decision to become a formal nurse leader or nurse manager. Nurses choosing to be nurse leaders outside of formal roles can apply all of the topics of this course to become better mentors, preceptors, or role models. Please follow the link to complete the 20 question end of course quiz. The content of this course is based on this wonderful resource that I highly recommend, Leadership and Management Competence in Nursing Practice. I have added the link for purchasing the text.